Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas on how to lead your church in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Whether you're a pastor, church leader, or a passionate member of your faith community, this podcast is designed to challenge, inspire, and equip you with the tools you need for impactful ministry. And now for a little bit about the guest for this episode. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. Today, Lauren Richmond Jr. welcomes Yolanda Solomon to the show. Yolanda M. Solomon is the Director of Discipleship at Epiphany Church in Brooklyn, New York, where she teaches and creates discipleship curriculum and resources. She has also worked in campus ministry at Columbia University in New York, where she was blessed to serve undergraduate students for seven years. Yolanda is a disciple of Christ, a Brooklyn native, and a lifelong Knicks fan, which richly fuels her prayer life. She lives in Brooklyn with her family. One housekeeping detail before our conversation begins, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, and share Future Christian with a friend. Your engagement helps to ensure that these important conversations about navigating and resourcing the future of the church continue and reach more people. All right, welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. This is Lauren Richmond Jr., and today I'm pleased to be joined by Yolanda Solomon. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Lauren. It's my pleasure. Uh, What else would you like our listeners to know about you today? Well, I am uh, a mom of two. I am married to my wonderful husband of 15 years. I am a Brooklyn native, born and raised in Brooklyn, still here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm a proud Knicks fan, which, as I say, richly fuels my prayer life. Yeah. And I have the pleasure of serving as a director of discipleship at a local church here in Brooklyn called Epiphany Church. Okay, well, you mentioned it, so I told you we were going to talk some Knicks basketball, so we're going to bore out our listeners here. Um, so I mentioned this, I'm in the Denver area, so I really like have become a Nuggets fan. We're really disappointed by the way this season ended for us. Um, so, I mean, obviously the Knicks and Nuggets have some tension with the whole Carmelo situation. Um, I'm curious, like, what's your take on... Carmelo, because us in Denver, like we're kind of burned by his whole like spurning us in Denver. Well, I honestly want to say that I don't really feel that the beef was with the Nuggets more so than the coach. And I can't remember his name. Um, oh, Carl. Yeah. Carl. George yeah, Carl. Because Carmelo Anthony like refers to him as a snake. He, he'll even put like <laughs> little snake emojis because it wasn't just Carmelo. J.R. Smith, also a former Nugget. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, Kenyon Martin, right? And so none of those guys have anything nice to say about Mr. Carl. And so I just feel like, you know, uh, there were two different philosophies. And, you know, George Carl is still talking about Carmelo all these years later. And so I have nothing but love for Carmelo. If you actually look behind me, this is actually a uh, birthday present my husband got for me years ago. This was Carmelo's 62-point game uh, back in 2014 uh, of January uh, against the Charlotte Bobcats, which are not oh, even the Bobcats yeah, anymore. Yeah. And so, you know, I, how can you not love Melo as a Knicks fan? For mm-hmm. us, we love him. He gave us, you know, some of his best years. I'll never forget the Easter Sunday game uh, against the Bulls. You know, Christ rose and the Knicks won. <laughs> it's like you can't... <laughs> You can't get any better than that, you know. But I, I like Denver. I like I like what y'all are doing over there. And you guys are champions. Like nobody feels bad for you. You guys have a ring. Yeah. So, you know, not the greatest season this year. Shorter ending. Yeah. Than I'm sure you would have hoped, but you guys are champions. So we're still waiting on that. Yeah. So obviously, it's been a few years, and uh, you can probably remember as well as I can the the what the '94 and '99. Do I have those years right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, the '99 season was especially fun for me. The Knicks run there. I, I of course remember the whole um, the LJ versus the Pacers that shot. Yeah, yeah, going crazy. Um, there were some hard times in the 2000s, right? They were rough. They were lean years, Lauren. Lean yeah. years. Yeah, famine even. And I, <laughs> I really kind of drifted away from um, 
following this because they're just so bad for so long. Yeah, you were right. You were right. You probably had better things to do with your life than watch <laughs> the Knicks. Um, I did not. We, I, I was there through the, you know, Barniani and mm-hmm. I mean Eddie Curry and you know Fizdale. I mean, it just was. It was awful. But you know what? God is the God of a turnaround. Yeah. So God has turned my Knicks around, and so we are in milk and honey these days. So, what do you think about? I mean, Jalen Br- Jalen Brunson is obviously a player um, from a. From an outside perspective, like I didn't really expect them to go as far as they did this year, just because beyond Jalen, I don't think they have a lot. Oh, um, yeah, that that's that outside perspective, Lauren. Okay, we, okay, we knew they were going far, and honestly, I think we would have been in the Eastern Conference Finals had it not been for the injuries. We literally, yeah. by the time we were in Game Seven against the Pacers, yeah. we didn't have one starter left. Mitch Robinson is gone. Brunson is gone. Randall is gone. OG and Anobi is gone. Yeah. Even Bogdanovich, our, <laughs> right. our pickup is gone. I mean, so literally none of the starters that we started this season with were healthy by the time we got to the Pacers. And as the Pacers saw, you know, with a Halliburton, with a torn hammy, right. not so easy to beat teams when your best <laughs> players are injured. So, you know, there you have it. Uh, I, I, I'm excited. I am proud. I am already ready for next season because I think a healthy Knicks team is a scary Knicks team. So Julian Rand, Jul- Julius, right? Julius Randall. Uh, we're getting real inside inside baseball, or as okay. they say, inside basketball here. So I apologize for our listeners here. Uh, I heard some commentary thinking Nick should let him go because he's a he's a ball stopper, and the you want to keep him. No, I don't know any Nick fans that want to get rid of Randall. Okay. We were all very, very upset. Number one, because he's having one of his best seasons, mm-hmm. the season when he got hurt by a certain uh, Miami Heat rookie who will remain nameless. <laughs> um, and yeah, Julius Randall is a hardworking guy. He's, you know, I think a lot of people forget that these guys are young men. Yeah. You know, and my husband even reminded me, like, how would you play, how would you feel playing basketball, having your second child during a pandemic like i remember like even the season before last like i think his wife had just given birth and it's like the middle of covid and there's all these like rules and regulations and like life is tough for new dads when you're not Mm -hmm. a professional basketball Mm -hmm. player but like add on top of that like being a professional basketball player your teammates are getting sick left and right and you're going home to an a newborn baby. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I think that's made me give Julius Randall a bit more grace, like reminding myself that he he is a, a man in his mid twenties <laughs> yeah. trying to figure it out, new dad. But I read an article about like the power of meditation. Like, I don't know if you noticed he'd been like meditating on the sidelines with one of the interesting uh, assistant coaches, and that's what calmed him down. Cause he was crazy. He was he was losing his mind a couple seasons ago. But he was like, Jalen Brunson just kind of like whispers in my ear. He's like the Randall whisperer and meditation uh before games. And I'm I'm here for it. I'm I'm hoping that Julius Randle retires a Nick. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so what do you think about next? So obviously, w- forgive us listeners here. I will promise to get to some like actual like religious content here, but got to talk some basketball. So what do you think? Like obviously here in Denver, we're kind of worried about KCP leaving, uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope because he's just a great 3 and D guy. Um, like what's the what's – the, perspective for next year like do you all have any key free agents leaving potentially i mean i think at the end of the day the knicks are focused on keeping uh og Ananobi and isaiah hartenstein really mm-hmm. that's the only two guys that you know really had breakout seasons um i mean everyone on the knicks had their best year ever mm-hmm. like dante divincenzo had his best season yeah josh hart best season ever um but isaiah hartenstein which i don't think anyone expected you yeah know, he was no good in denver well yeah no and he but he was on the clippers and he showed promise and we got him and he just was supposed to be a serviceable backup and surprise mm-hmm. surprise he ended up taking mitchell robinson's starting spot and we're not letting him go so i think that's if, if we can just keep lockdown ogn and ob who i mean I, I think we were like undefeated in january when we got him i was very sad to lose to lose quickly in rj but my sadness turned to joy Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> after those first three or four games and i was like huh we don't ever seem to lose while this guy is playing yeah he seems to be able to defend three players at once um so if we can just keep in and ob and hartenstein and bring back the bring the team back just run it back 
mm-hmm. I think would be fine. Yeah. Yeah, he's got to figure out Boston. I mean, they're not going anywhere, right? Yeah, they're not going anywhere. But I think I think we can beat them. Okay. I think we can beat them. I think we can. I think we can beat just about anybody because, as you've seen, not Denver, but that's okay. I mean, <laughs> Jamal Murray. You know, I've used Jamal Murray as an object lesson to my oldest son. Don't be a Jamal. Be a Jalen. Like, t- oh, <laughs> okay, throw, okay. Don't throw heat packs on the floor. Yeah, that's Take true. That's true. <laughs> Take responsibility for your mistakes. Um, the point guard, I mean, and this is the last thing I'll say about the Knicks. It's been so long since we've had a true point guard. Jalen Brunson is a consummate, just human being. Mm-hmm. Like, and he makes everyone better. And that goes a long way in the playoffs. Like that goes a lot. Like also he's playing with like his best friends from college, which you just couldn't. Right. I'm sure Disney right. is going to write a movie about this. Like, you know, as you know, Lauren, working with your friends makes a difference. It does. It does. And that kind of chemistry coupled with healthy all-stars like Randall and I think OG and a budding all-star, I think we'll be just fine. All right. We'll leave it there for the basketball talk <laughs> since this is not a basketball pod. Um, but good, good, good stuff here. Uh, Anything else you want to say about yourself, your journey of faith? Well, yeah. I mean, I grew up, I mean, I talk about this in the book, so this sort of leans into the book, but I grew up um, in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in a predominantly African-American church. And I mean, I know this isn't everyone's testimony, but I really liked church growing up. Church was like, it felt like home. It felt like Mm -hmm. family, like friends of mine from school went to my church. It was a very community church. Um, But as I grew older um, and met different kinds of Christians, I realized that my experience was not everyone's experience. Um, It was a super black church. And I'll just say like Al Sharpton preached our Palm Sunday sermon every year. So that's the kind of church it was definitely steeped in a civil rights tradition. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we had like, you know, our sister churches in the neighborhood where, you know, Dr. King would had preached Mm -hmm. in in years past. And so I was, you know, on the usher board and the youth choir and the Girl Scouts and all the youth activities. And I really, really did love church. But as I talk about in the book, when I went to college, I kind of sort of straight away stopped going to church. They're really my friends in college didn't do church, so I stopped going. Um, I did still sing in the gospel choir, though. Hmm. <laughs> so Christian activities, I always like to sing. But um, there was a turning point my junior year of college. I talk about this in the book where I was going to make some big decisions with regard to my life. And I was in Los Angeles for a semester because I was either going to live there or here. And um, God sent someone into my life uh, who I I, I say in the book, she discipled me without even me knowing I was being discipled. I didn't really have that language back then. But what I say is she really embodied the love and compassion of Christ at a really formative time in my life. And she was real. She wasn't a weirdo. She (laughs) (laughs) was just a normal person and I knew her from back home you know we grew up in the same church in Brooklyn she was a bit older than me but you know I you know I, we knew we knew each other and she kind of took me under her wing and that was life changing for me and so after uh, my junior year of college I came back to New York a changed woman um I believe because I encountered Jesus through this person who loved me in really practical ways you know I talk about in the book how she just would I didn't have, I'm not going to give the whole book away, but right. she she would like pick me up uh, from my apartment where I was staying and I didn't have a car. I'm from Brooklyn. You don't need a car mm-hmm. in Brooklyn. Uh, you need one in LA. Yeah. And she would like drive me to get groceries, which if you've ever sat in LA traffic, that's a very Christ-like thing to do, like voluntarily <laughs> <laughs> to cart a belligerent 20-year-old college student around. Um And she just loved me and she never changed. She was the same person, whether we were just in the car getting groceries or whether we were at a fancy industry party. She's an actress, by the way. Mm -hmm. She was a pretty successful working actress. Um, And yeah, she never changed no matter where we were, which also impressed me. Yeah. So something I think yeah. in the book is that discipleship is caught and not taught. Yeah. And I was watching. I was watching her sneakily model a very Christ-like life in front of me. Share, if you would, any spiritual practices that are meaningful for you. Spiritual practices that are meaningful for me. Um, I take a lot of walks, you know. Um, I live in New York City, which is a walkable town. I have two kids, which doesn't make for much 
you know, time to just pour over scripture for hours and yeah. hours. Um, but I do enjoy uh, waking up before them and just going for walks, listening to, um, you know, sermons, or sometimes listening to just music and walking and praying. I love, I'm a big fan of prayer walk. Mm-hmm. Um, I need the exercise, uh, but it also it's just calming for my soul. And so um, that's something that I find really life-giving. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So I, I'm looking forward to chatting here about your book. Yolanda is the author of the book, Discipleship as Holy Collaboration, Helping Others Follow Jesus in Real Life. Yeah. And I was going to start off this conversation just by the generic question, what inspired the book? But then I thought, I wanted to start it this way. I'm kind of of the opinion of late that we live in a culture that tells us we need to be empowered and authenticated Whereas the Christian message, at least as I understand it, tells us we need to be saved and discipled. Hmm. And I'm just curious, you work in discipleship. Obviously, you're, you've written here about discipleship. Yeah. What do you make of, I'm curious, do you see a similar dynamic and what do you make of it and the, the dichotomy that church faces in culture? When you say powered and authenticated, you mean like, like a self action, like right to like self actualization, right? Like, could you give me an example, like just off top? And then I, I've got something to say. Yeah, because I'm I'm thinking about it like in a, in another in a recent conversation I had with Dwight Shiley, he he said something to the effect that the the modern age is that we think we can save ourselves. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no. um, Well, when you say discipled, and the thing about discipleship, and I mentioned this earlier, is that that was, even though I grew up in the church, I never really heard that word. Mm -hmm. I heard disciple, like Mm -hmm. be a disciple. We're called to be disciples. We're called to be followers. And um, when I think about that, it, it to me, and maybe I'm naive, Lauren, it just seems so simple that at the end of the day, a disciple is a follower. Hmm. And our call is to follow Jesus. Jesus, you know, in the Christian tradition, it's God coming to earth, stepping into this very broken world to answer the question that God asks in Genesis chapter three, verse nine, right? Where are you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Why aren't you with me? You're. Why are you hiding from me? Why is my presence a problem? And that question, I would say, if you really want to think about the meta narrative of scripture, is asked all throughout the Old Testament, the prophets, um, you know, judges, uh, the Psalms, like God beckoning his creation back to fellowship yeah. with him. yeah, And so I, I believe in Jesus, God comes down, condescends to be with us to say, I'm super serious about answering this question. Where are you? Hmm. Like, you need to be with me. And so you know what? I'm going to come and be with you, right? And what does Jesus do? He goes around and, you know, pr- you know pardon, this might sound crass, his shtick is follow me, follow yeah. me. He goes around telling people, Follow me, follow me, follow me. But what does that mean? I take it to mean following my footsteps. Mm. He's constantly showing us how to live, showing us how to be human, showing us how to love, showing us how to be obedient children, right? Like he's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He's the messianic king. And so he's showing us how to lead, but he's also, also and giving us a new paradigm for leadership, which is service. But he's also showing us how to be obedient children Mm -hmm. of God. Like he's our older brother. I love that Hebrews chapter two refers to Jesus as our older brother. Because I think that's a metaphor we can grab hold of. Right. If you have an older sibling who like learns how to ride a bike before you or go to college before you or, you know, learn how to do something. But like Jesus is that older brother who kind of forth the path. He's our pioneer in life. He's our pioneer in humanity. And like, this is how you guys were created to live. Follow in my footsteps as you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so what I see, you know, then and now the call for the modern day disciple, it's, I don't think it's changed, Lauren. I think it's follow in the footsteps of Jesus as you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's how I would, you know, describe discipleship. And I think getting off course is why we're in the trouble we are today as the American church. 
Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for engaging that with me. So that leads me to another question I was going to ask later, but you mentioned the challenge in the early church, or excuse me, the challenge we face here in our current context. Right. And I was thinking about, you're probably familiar as I am with the, the church growth movement, so to speak, from like the 90s to the thousand, to the 2000s. Right. And as I understand, a lot of that was built off transfer growth membership, people leaving one congregation for another. Sure. So there's this really this kind of expectation of just quick, like, well, we can just start something and boom, you know, a, a new church and we can start with 150, we're 200, 300, 1,000 before you know it. Um, this influence of startup and tech of, of 10x growth mm. is so... Uh, baked into our thinking oftentimes. Yeah. Yet, as we think about the change in our at least American context, and I think broadly North American, where the kind of cultural Christianity is going away, and this is just what struck me when I was reading your book, and you even telling that story again of your 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 discipleship person in college, like how much this is a long term effort like there's not going to be like right. immediate dynamic growth sure sure yeah um and I, again i just go back to the bible in the book i spent a lot of time in the gospels mm -hmm. because i think we need to encounter jesus in order to know how to follow we need to know who we're following mm -hmm. and i think a big problem in america is we don't we don't agree on who jesus is first of all yeah <laughs> Not wrong. For some, Jesus is this warrior, <laughs> Caesar king who's here to crush my enemies. Right. And all everybody that I hate, God hates. Yeah. And and to worship means to, you know, invoke the wrath of God right. on my enemies. Right. You know? And so I spent a lot of time in the gospels because I believe, like, don't believe me. Don't take my word for it. Let's look in the Bible. And so when I look at Jesus, he engages people over a period of time. Now, obviously, Jesus' you know, earthly ministry is three years um, with his disciples. Mm -hmm. you know, he had, a, he had Obviously, he was younger. He had time. Right. But as we know, it, his earthly ministry is three years. But in those three years, Jesus is playing the long game. Mm -hmm. Jesus actually is spending quite a bit of time telling them, I'm leaving you guys. Like, over and over and over again from Mark. If you look in the Gospel of Mark, from chapter one until you get to about uh, chapter 13, he's constantly saying, specifically around chapter 8, from between chapter 8 to chapter 13, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be beaten. I'm leaving you guys. Right. So here are some instructions. And he is committed to walking this these ragtag followers through what it means to have an alternative consciousness, Walter Brueggemann calls it, mm -hmm. right? What, what it means to imagine that another world is possible, what it means to imagine that like first century Galilee is not all there is, right? Like being colonized by the Romans and just the way of life that they see it. Like there's another way of living. Jesus calls it the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. right? Where the last are first and where it doesn't matter who's going to be at my right. They're arguing who's going to be vice president, who's going to be secretary right, of state, right, right. coming right. to your kingdom. And Jesus is like, it's not about power. It's actually about you laying down your life for others the way I'm about to go lay down my life for you. And Jesus tells them this because he knows he's leaving, which presupposes that Jesus knows that this is a lifelong journey, right? It's not this like quick, yeah. all right, um, Jesus is checking off numbers as, as people are, you know, following yeah. him and, and, and keeping a tally of metrics, right? No, <laughs> Jesus is like, I'm leaving and actually I need you guys to take care of each other. Right. Right. I love that discourse of uh, mother, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. Mm -hmm. Like y'all take care of each other because I'm out. Of, I'm about to be out. So I need you guys to love one another as I have loved you. But I'm going to send yeah. you the power. Send the spirit. Right. Acts chapter Acts chapter one. They're like, are you good? Is, it, is this the time you're going to restore Israel? And he's like, what are you guys? No, forget that. Now's not the, the time, but forget about time. 
I'm going to give you power from on high so that you can go and you can share my good news with everyone. And and the Peter and the John that we see in Acts chapter 3 are so different than the Peter that we see in Luke 22 when he's denying Jesus mm-hmm. and he's, you know, he's a he's a coward, which honestly all of right. us would be. I'd right. be a little scared, you know, Jesus just being crucified and they want to do that to me. No thanks. I don't know him, right? But 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 this is this is a journey. This is a journey, right? And so even after Jesus is ascended to heaven and has poured his spirit out, the disciples are finally figuring out year a, 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 a bit or so later, wow, this is what it means to proclaim the good works of Jesus without fear. This is what it means to, uh, I mean, I, one of my favorite passages of scripture and I'll just stick with Peter here, is in Acts chapter four, after Peter's been arrested, he's been threatened, don't preach anymore. Um, he goes to a small group of, I believe, and I believe they're new Christians because Acts chapter two says, you know, thousands were added. So these are newly saved believers. Mm-hmm. And he says, I, and he asks for prayer. Hmm. He asks for them to pray and they pray this powerful prayer. Um, and and I And I love that the same Peter that, couldn't be that that kind of got caught by himself trying to follow Jesus by himself. He got caught out there slipping, yeah. you would say, in Brooklyn, yeah. and he denies Jesus. Now he knows, uh uh uh, when I'm in trouble, when I'm scared, you're not going to catch me by myself again. I'm going back to my community and I'm going to pray with them for the courage to, what does he say, proclaim the word boldly, right? That's a different man. That's a spirit filled man. That's a man who knows the value of community. There's not this hierarchical top down. Oh, you know, Peter's just going to grit it and just be a super Christian. And I know, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm still answering your question, but he's like, no, the power of th- that I'm going to need to follow Jesus is going to come from the Holy Ghost, but it's also going to come from this body of believers that I am now connected to. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's stay on that. Cause you write in your book about, at least as I interpret it, the reciprocal can't say the word reciprocal nature of discipleship. Yeah. You, you know, you you mentioned there Peter going to what we would interpret as new believers, saying, "Hey, I need prayer." Mm-hmm. And discipleship in church context can often be, mm-hmm. like you mentioned, a, a top-down relationship. You know, continue to talk about the importance in discipleship of that reciprocal nature. Right, and so my. Uh, years ago, I was, I was, uh, we were doing a Bible study at church in Philippians. And I think that's what kind of sparked this for me because I've worked in a local church Mm -hmm. now in Brooklyn here for about three years. But before then, I worked in campus ministry. I worked in campus ministry, um, at Columbia University for about eight years, um, serving undergraduate students. Phenomenal. But the age gap was a bit more. And so for years, I only thought that the mentoring, um, and the discipleship was only supposed to kind of be one directional, yeah. right? Not reciprocal, mm-hmm. right? Like I do the teaching, I do the exhortation, I do the encouraging. And it really made me feel like I couldn't share any of my doubts, any of my weariness, any of my fears mm-hmm. with somebody that I was discipling because I'm like, wow, if they see me struggling, they're going to think, oh, well, if Yolanda's a leader and she's struggling or she has doubts, what hope is there for me? Yeah. And, you know, mentors helped me to see, number one, that that was super prideful. Mm. Um, but also what, what what I say in the book is that when we don't uh, pour when we pour out in ministry and don't allow people to pour in. I don't care if they've been a Christian for a week. We're saying to them, "I don't need you." That's good. We're saying yeah. what Paul says in First Corinthians twelve of you know the foot says to the elbow, right. "I don't need right. you." Right. As the, and this is the metaphor of yep. the body of Christ. I you know, and we don't say it out loud, "I don't need you." But what we also do is we rob them of we rob ourselves of a vital means of grace, and we rob our mentee or our disciple mm-hmm. and example to embody the good news that we're trying to teach them about. And so one of the things that I do now is regularly ask people that I'm mentoring to pray for me. That's good. And sometimes yeah. I'm like, ooh, pray for you. And I'm like, yeah, pray for me. I need it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm stressed out, right? Life is tough. You know, I got this going on and that going on. And number one, th- they are happy to do it. But number two, they are so, I believe, grateful for an opportunity to embody 
the very things that I kind of talk to them about, about prayer being communion, prayer being communication, prayer being conversation, but prayer also being us co-laboring with mm, God. Mm-hmm. And, in, and I, in their hearts, they're like, wow, I'm working with God to do whatever God is trying to do in you. And I think that's extremely empowering for people because I want people to see discipleship as us participating in what God is already doing. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it takes away the like hierarchical nature where some Christian is up here, you know, the pastor, the preacher, the minister here, and then the rest of us are just down here. Um, Because that's, that's not, biblical, right? Jesus said, there's only one teacher, right? I'm it. The rest of you guys are students in my school, in the school of Jesus. One more example, and I won't uh, talk too deep in this because this is in the book, but if you think about even Paul's relationship with the Philippian church, I love um, what he says. He says in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 28, he says, um, uh, I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus, that what happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and I hope that I will have sufficient courage so that Christ will be exalted in my body. And and I love that, that there's this vulnerability where he's sharing, he's inviting them into his anxiety. He's He's inviting them to share in his sufferings. Uh, all through the letter to the Philippians. And and he's also, he's saying, I'm confident in the Holy Spirit, but I'm also confident in your prayers, right? Like, I know that through your prayers and the provision of the Holy Ghost, that what has happened to me will work out for my deliverance. And so I love that Paul doesn't minimize his suffering to protect the Philippians. Yeah. He invites them into his suffering. Yeah. And then they send help. They send this man named Epaphroditus with real tangible help uh, to help Paul. But then Paul doesn't have like this, like, uh, I, I call like a toxic kind of relationship where he he's banking on his apostolic pedigree yeah. to to sanctify them. He says, no, no, no. The work that God began in you, I'm confident that God will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Not my confidence is in the work that Paul has begun, even though he kind of technically did begin the work. Like Paul recognizes that he's part of something much bigger than himself. Paul recognizes that there's a mutuality between him and the Philippian church. And Paul is happy to partner with them, right? There's this beautiful word, koinonia, mm-hmm. in the Greek that is used so much in Philippians that literally means gospel partnership. And I think that if we viewed our discipleship relationships as partnerships, you'd have a lot less burnt out pastors, you'd have a lot less burnt out Christians, right. and you'd have a lot more new Christians actually walking out their faith in a way that is enriching and life-giving. Yeah, so much good, so much good stuff you're saying there. Because I, I can just think about it through multiple elements, like A, you know, the pastor or church leader getting burned out and worn out from trying to be everything to everybody, um, mm. you know, the kind of the 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 mentality that can so often be in churches where it's like the person or person comes in and is like, feed me, feed me, feed me. It's like, hey, that mm. that's part of your job too, right? Uh, mm. Such, appreciate your insights there. Let me, let me ask this question too, because it's coming to mind. Uh, I think when I think of discipleship, and I think this is a fair characterization, what what is commonly understood as discipleship, it's either as memorization, like you write about in the book, Mm. or I think conversely, in different contexts, it can be this kind of like fear, shame, and hatred. And maybe hatred's too strong, but it can be this kind of like fear and shame about, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to force, I shouldn't say force, but we're going to drive behavioral change one way through either getting you to memorize a bunch of stuff or kind of fearing and shaming you into, and I think this happens on on both sides of Christianity, whether it's a conservative side or a more progressive liberal side. Talk about those two paths and why do you think those are not conducive to yeah. real strength discipleship yeah um in the book i talk about the the trio of fear shame and hatred Mm -hmm. and i say that if you use fear shame and hatred to 
disciple people or to bring them to God, you have to keep them afraid, yeah. ashamed, and angry. Yeah. And um, I think we see all three of those in the American church today where uh, whether it's people saying, you know, come to Jesus, come to my church, because th- there's th- they're afraid of being replaced. I mean, we mm-hmm. literally saw marches right. in Virginia, in various parts of America where the chant was, you will not replace right. us. And it's like, the church is dwindling. Our children and our grandchildren aren't coming to church. Right. What are we going to do? We're going to be replaced, right? And I say that fear is such a weak motivation mm-hmm. for discipleship because you have to keep people afraid, right. right? And so, you know, then, then, and and also, biblically, the Bible says that love casts out fear. And so, you know, if your motivation is fear, once people stop being afraid, then they're going to stop following, yeah. right? We're, and then also shame, right? If you're just constantly having people question their salvation, and every Sunday there's an altar call, and every Sunday, you know, ooh, you know, if you've sinned this week, come on and get it right. There's just this never-ending cycle of shame where discipleship just is manufactured sorrow mm-hmm. and condemnation. Mm-hmm. And you never actually get around to following Jesus because you're so busy, you know, beating yourself up over sins that Jesus already died mm-hmm. for, right? And then with the hatred, I mean, we don't have to go right. further right. than January 6th, you know, where it's like America is a Christian nation. We've got to keep it pure. We've got to keep a Christian, whatever that means. And uh, that means, you know, getting rid of these others, mm-hmm. you know, making sure these others don't cross our borders because they're going to pollute our Christian witness. Whereas Jesus says in Matthew 25, you know, when I was a stranger, you invited me in and his disciples say, wait a minute, when were you ever a stranger? And now for us, you know, we don't, we, we, we hear stranger and we think, well, what does that mean? But the Greek root word for stranger is xenos, which is where we get our root, our word for xenophobia, yeah. right? <laughs> which, you know, we, we know xenophobia has to do with, a you know, intense hatred or fear of, you know, people from another nation. And so Jesus is saying, listen, in the kingdom There are no strangers. In the kingdom, everyone is your neighbor. And I identify with the stranger. So whatever you do for the least of those, you do for me, right? And so back to why fear, shame, and hatred are a horrible means of discipleship. They just don't last, yeah. number one. But number two, they, they're they not the way of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus didn't gather people by making them ashamed, afraid, or hating their neighbor. Jesus built his kingdom through self-sacrificial love. He said, you know, the kingdom of God is near. And then he just gets to the work of serving and loving and calls us to follow him, right? And so I think discipleship... Um, Bad discipleship usually is, and I've fallen into this trap, yeah. you know, where I, someone says, hey, Yolanda, I want to grow. You know, I really don't enjoy reading scripture or I don't enjoy praying, you know, help me to grow in my discipline. And there's always that word discipline they use. And, you know, I could give them a list of things to memorize. I could ha- give them index cards of scripture, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I think the goal is you want people to get their word in their heart. Right. But see, what this does is, I, I think what it does is it help makes us forget that disi- sa- salvation is a miracle. Mm. Hmm. We, we've, I think we've actually forgotten that what we are involved in is miraculous. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Discipleship mm-hmm. is about heart transformation, right? It's about a new heart and a new spirit and new affections. When Jesus says you must be born again, that's a metaphor, yeah. right? Uh, Nicodemus is like, how can I go back <laughs> in my mother's womb? And Jesus is like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I want to change the way you love. I want to change who, what, and how you love. Jesus is talking about I want to change the way you love. I want to change who, what, and how you love by the power of my spirit. And, and Lauren, that takes time. That's a, that's sanctification. That's progressive. That's lifelong, right? And as you encounter me, who, what, and how you love slowly, slowly starts to match who, what, and how I love, right? And that has nothing to do with fear or shame right. or hatred, right? That has to do with us being slowly changed and slowly being sanctified as we encounter Jesus, as the Holy Spirit does the heavy lifting of heart transformation, and as we are loving 
flesh and blood people. This all can't just be about mental ascent to doctrine. Right. It has to actually like have flesh and blood, you know, tangibility at some point or else it's too theoretical. It's not real. I say in the book that discipleship has to introduce people to the body of Christ or else it's just too theoretical, right? I need to love actual people and be patient with actual people and serve actual people and bear the burdens of actual people in order for this to actually do what I believe Jesus kind of rigged this to do all along, which is change our hearts. Boy, I really appreciate really appreciate your words there and so much so much is fitting into I think the theme of what you know, your book obviously in our conversation let me let me ask you one more question here before we take a break. Um, oh, this I was trying to remember the question. So we kind of talked about this earlier, but how do how would you advise churches, pastors, and church leaders to kind of create a culture of discipleship? Like we talked about earlier, church can often be this kind of like feed me mentality where the the folks come in expecting to be fed, the pastor has this expectation external or internal could, could, to kind of do all the, the feeding and the teaching. How do we create a more mutual uh, discipleship culture? Yeah, I think, first of all, it does have to start with the head. Mm. I think, you know, um, for better or for worse, people look to pastors, right, to model right. and lead. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But I think, honestly, pastors for whom that is true, where there's like the pastor and maybe like two or three other people who do all the work, right. <laughs> the pastor has to like call call themselves out. They have to say, this is kind of going to end. And they have to realize that it's not going to end overnight. They have to take the risk to begin to disciple people. Maybe I would say just start, if a pastor were to start meeting with maybe five to six people on a weekly basis and just begin to train them. And I talk about this in Mm -hmm. my book, you know, how to do this. Um, And then empower those people. And that's usually where it... (laughs) It, it stops because that's risky. Right. You now have to say, I'm going to trust people who may not preach like me, who may not teach like me, who may not pray like right. me, who may may not articulate, uh, you know, uh, doctrinal truth the way I do to say, you know what, instead of this counseling session that I'm going to have with Sister Sheila or Brother Craig, you know what, can you do that? Can you meet with them? Right. And now, and this is the, these are the people that now the pastor's been meeting with and maybe going through a book with, you know, you could get my book uh, <laughs> or many books. There are many books to get. Um, empower the trellis and the vine is a great book. Actually, uh, my pastor brought us through that and then say, you know what, can you actually, uh, meet and have coffee with this this new believer who just came and 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 then let me know how that goes right and do that with like 10 people yeah. and now all of a sudden instead of one person doing all the counseling all the discipling you've got 10 people meeting with 10 people right and then just over a period of time what ends up happening is that you have the body of Christ being the body of right. Christ and what what's beautiful about that is that we're all different And I think that scares some pastors, Mm -hmm. the difference in like, they're not going to do it how I do it. But first Peter chapter four, verse 10 says, no matter what gift you have, use your gift to serve, right? And we all have different giftings. Like some of us have great administrative gifts. Some of us have great preaching and exhortation gifts. Some of us have amazing prayer gifts. Some of us have gifts of hospitality. And, And the beauty is it's the same Holy Ghost. It's the same Holy Spirit hitting the body of Christ. And it's almost like a prism, right? How we're a. Snyder in his book, Community of the King, King, talks about the body of Christ as this prism. And as the Holy Spirit hits you and hits me and hits him and hits her, what comes out is this beautiful light of, of, of grace and of, of, of power, the power of God, that's going to look different. The same way light looks different when it hits a prism right. and it goes that way and it refracts that way and it refracts that way. As the Holy Ghost hits me and hits you and hits this one and that one, it's going to shine out different towards someone but it's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit. And then I think that begets more disciples because now from that coffee, now that person knows that person, right? And they don't just only know the pastor, right? I think what happens is when you have the pastor doing all the work or just two or three people, that's a great way to get people to quit right, and retire right. early or start or start drinking, yeah. which <laughs> like we don't, we don't want that. So yeah, that's my advice. So much good points there. Uh, 
we need to take a break, but so many good points there I want to highlight. Like, A, I'm just thinking about like, you know, the the church secession model is like so many churches like falter when they change pastors because it's so built up on like the the singular figure. Uh, two, I'm right. thinking about like early, early, early church. Like how did the gospel spread? It was by people telling their neighbors. Like it wasn't sure. Like Paul and yeah. there were many leaders there who were sharing, but it was people telling people. Um, so you, you necessarily didn't recommend your book or, but I will recommend your book here. Uh, Discipleship as Holy Collaboration, Helping Others Follow Jesus in Real Life. Definitely want to recommend it. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, it should be available, I assume, wherever books are sold. Yes? It's available everywhere, Lauren. And I've been saying this on interviews. Uh, it's also, some people don't like reading books. I've I found out mm. if you don't like turning pages, it's available as an audiobook on audiobooks.com. You know, you can wash your dishes, vacuum, yeah. pick your kids up from school and listen to me talk about discipleship. Well, <laughs> I would be glad to listen to you talk about discipleship too. So I'm sure our listeners would as well. Uh, let's take a quick break and come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with Yolanda Solomon. So thanks for the conversation. Really appreciate your perspectives here. For these closing questions, I always tell folks you can take these as seriously or not as you'd like to. Uh, But if you're Pope for a day, what might that day look like for you? Pope for the day? Uh, I don't know. A lot of traveling. I like to travel. The Pope goes a Mm -hmm. lot away a lot. I love Italy. I was telling my husband I'd love to go to Sicily and uh, eat some seafood by the sea. So if I were the Pope for the day, I would definitely take the advantage to travel, meet people, pray with people, eat some good food, which is what I imagine the Pope does. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Some really good Italian food kind of making me hungry here. Uh, A theologian or historical Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Okay. But honorable mention to Jarena Lee, who was one of the first women who preached uh, in the AME church in Philadelphia. I believe she was part of Richard Allen's church. Okay. Yeah. Who, Deep yeah. pulls there. So she, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've, I'm reading an um, autobiography about her uh, called Sisters in the Spirit. Okay. Um, uh, three Black Women's Autobiographies of the 19th Century. And so I'm learning about Jarena Lee, Zilpha Elaw, and Julia Foote. Um, and so Dietrich Bonhoeffer first. Um, I would want to bring him back to life for obvious sure. reasons because America has gone crazy. But Jarena Lee, I'd love to just like have coffee with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just reading a book about the uh, – I'm reading a church history book about the founding of the AME Church. So uh, – Fresh in my mind. All right. Um, what do you think history will remember from our current time and place? <laughs> I don't know. It's wild. I live in Brooklyn, New York, and our former president was just convicted. That is true as we're recording this. Charges. Yes. Yeah, like literally. So uh, this is a crazy time in history. I will tell you, I don't know what history will remember. I know what I will remember, that I would like to live in some precedent in times. I'm really sick of living in <laughs> unprecedented times. I just want some regular old, you know, Bill Bill Clinton on the Arsenio Hall show playing the saxophone. Um, I think that, no, no, no. But to be serious, I think that history will remember this as a turning point where we turn mm. Is up to yeah, us. That's good. But yeah. I think history will remember this t- current time, 2024, as a turning point in history. Yeah, right. That where we turn is up to us. Uh, what do you hope for the future of Christianity? Oh, I'm going to keep this one simple. I hope for the future of Christianity that we would look to the past, ironically, in order to go forward. I think how we go forward is largely based on how we look at the past. And I think as we look to the way of Jesus, look to the simple, humble way of Jesus, where the gospel was super simple, lay down your lives for others, pick up your cross, love your neighbor as I have loved you. That's my hope for the future, that Christians really just kind of make the main thing the main thing again. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, where can people connect with you and find out more about your, your stuff? 
Yeah, I am Yolanda Solomon with o- all O's, S-O-L-O-M-O-N, uh, Yolanda.Solomon.BK on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter if you can find me there. I'm a little spicy on Twitter, though, so, you know, govern yourselves accordingly. Um, and my website is Yolandasolomon.site. Uh, and so you can find me on the interwebs and my book is available for sale everywhere. Uh, bookshop, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, audiobooks.com, Target, Walmart. If you just Google Yolanda Solomon, you will find me. And a lot of people don't know this. My book is put out by InterVarsity Press. And if you go to the InterVarsity Press website, you can download a sample chapter. So you can try before you buy. You can actually uh, read a sample chapter of my book. Uh, on the Inner Varsity Press website. I'll have to see if I can get that in the show notes. That'd yeah, be good. Yeah, I That'd can be good. You. Okay, well, um, I, I want to go back to talking Nick's basketball here, but I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll relent. Um, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate the conversation. Again, appreciate the book and uh, appreciate your ministry. Always leave folks with a word of peace. So may God's peace be with you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is produced by Resonate Media, and we love to hear from our listeners with questions, comments, and ideas for future episodes. Visit our website at future-christian.com and find the Connect With Us form at the bottom of the page. But before you go, do us a favor, subscribe to the pod to leave a review. It really helps us get this out to more people. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.